everyone, wherever in the world you are, at whatever time. Thank you for staying up late if it's night there for you. This is the Ways to Decolonize Your Fiction Writing Talk. And I am Vita Cruz, writer, editor, artist. I'm from the Philippines. I have a book out called Beyond the Line of Trees. Oh, sorry. Did, did we just start? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, I have a book out called Beyond the Line of Trees. It's a fantasy fiction collection. I will link that later in the chat. And just recently, I have been nominated for a Hugo Award for my work at FIACON with my team. And we, I would, I would like to say that FIACON is a BIPOC-centered uh, convention, and we tried to make it as accessible as possible, which is why I believe I am qualified to give you this talk. So let me load up the PowerPoint and share my screen. Okay, so a couple of reminders as I start ways to decolonize your fiction writing. Uh, this talk is inflammatory by nature of its content alone, no matter how polite the delivery. So if anything in this talk offends you, breathe in and out slowly and count to 10 before reacting. And also, I will not be taking questions regarding co cultural appropriation and how to write a different culture, because I feel like we could have a richer discussion if I don't have to answer that question. If you want me to answer a question on Discord, tag me, Vida Cruz, and I will get to that after this talk. And lastly, we all have something colonial about our mindsets, even those of us who are marginalized. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to unlearn this mindset. And hopefully this talk will push you in the right direction if you're just beginning to do that. So some definitions first, just so we're on the same page. Colonialism the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. This is the definition that comes up for colonialism on Google. But colonialism has so many more components apart from this. Colonialism in, is made up of sexism, racism, classism, homophobia, anti-environmentalism, religious intolerance, ableism, and imperialism. All of these isms are used to, to subjugate a people. And I should know because my country, the Philippines, has been colonized three times and has experienced all of this. I do want to note that while I can't give you examples because that will take up so much of our talk and we don't have a lot of time, um, when I say environ anti-environmentalism, it's not just the destruction of the environment. It's looking upon the natural world and thinking of yourself as master of it and not as part of it. So now that I've gotten this out, what do I mean by decolonize? This, these are illustrations from the Boxer Codex. They depict what 16th century Tagalogs looked like when the Spanish stumbled onto our shores. Am I advocating for a return to this way of life? Of course not. What I mean by decolonize is this tweet encapsulates it perfectly. Decolonization isn't reverting back to life 600 years ago. It's bringing a new harmony and balance that's informed by our ancestors. Decolonization is uprooting the colonial capitalist system as a whole and making a world where no one lives at the expense of another. And that last line is key to everything I'm going to tell you after this point. Okay, I've structured this talk around certain elements of fiction. We're gonna start with setting first because this is the catnip of all of us writers of science fiction and fantasy. This is a map of fantasy land, which came with Diana Wynne Jones's Tough Guide to Fantasy Land, a cult classic. Um, if, I highly recommend this book. 
Diana Wynne Jones was a fantasist herself. If you haven't read any of her work, she was behind Hal's Moving Castle. Um, this guidebook is also kind of like a dictionary. And in it, she satirizes all of epic fantasy. And she wrote this in 1994. Much of what she wrote there still holds true today, especially the entries on enemy races, which are always evil, missing heirs, and so on and so forth. If you look at this map upside down, it's actually a map of Europe. The place, uh, the place names are anagrams that parody those found in fantasy books. Look, I'll be straight with you. I think science fiction and fantasy today has an empire problem. Many stories are set in empires from the POV of protagonists who will inherit the throne or throw down the old rulers and take the throne for themselves. Or in some cases, become the monsters they seek to destroy in the service of revenge. But I'm going to talk about that point more when I get to theme. In reality, when it comes to setting, empires are made up of various cultures. But in a lot of books published today, empires, whether a single empire or two or more competing empires, are portrayed as monocultures. And when someone from a marginalized culture reads your book, this is a very easy way to get pegged as a racist, even if your intention is well-meaning. The So, um, hold on a moment. Homogenizing everything, squashing what is unique, is exactly what real-life empires have done and continue to do. But some of the uniqueness will continue to survive. You may write about an empire that does this, this one empire, one religion, one language, one race, one cuisine, one fashion, one magic system or technology. But you don't want your worldview to reflect this homogeny. For example, one way to avoid this is to write about other forms of government. And some examples are thalassocracies, which are maritime empires. And a real life example of this is the pre-colonial cultures of Southeast Asia. You can also have vassal states, unrecognized states, so on and so forth. There's so much, just pick one. Maybe this is just a personal taste of mine, but I'm tired of empire and no one is interrogating the inherently imperial we call that the imperial philosophy driving empire and actually it's not true not no one is interrogating but the people who are interrogating them are largely people from marginalized backgrounds okay. so another way to avoid this is to consider adding complexity to the society more than one language competing more than one competing tradition, mythology, old and new currencies, different ethnicities and races, and so on and so forth. There are many interesting stories to be told when these different aspects of society intersect. Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on a moment here. A world or a snapshot of one is made up of all of these things on this list. This, by the way, is a um, screenshot from a slide in a presentation I gave at Flights of Foundry last year, which was about world building in mythology. And all these things you can find in mythology and in uh, a very well-built epic. But you see, when you're dealing with a microculture, even if you know all these things, your character not um a single character won't notice everything about this especially especially if you're writing from first person point of view they won't notice all of this they'll only notice what they've been shaped to notice by their circumstances upbringing and environment and which is why i could um i put forward this um i suppose axiom that setting is rooted in character, and it's about what is noticed and who does the noticing. Again, so some examples for you coming up. A ballroom and a peasant girl. A 
peasant girl will notice everything about this ballroom, but in a very shallow surface level kind of way, she will likely think to herself that she's never seen so much gold in her life and will woefully out of, feel woefully out of place while simultaneously admiring everything. An artist will notice the frescoes on the ceiling, the mosaics on the arches, the make of the chandelier, the weave and the colors of the carpet. He may comment on the aesthetics of the room, the history and materials that went into making the different decorations, and he may pass artistic judgment overall. A queen will notice why the hell aren't there any tables of food in this hall when it should be a ball, or why is there no orchestra playing, or why the platform for the thrones is empty. She will notice as well the relationship dynamics between her guests. She may even comment on the livery of her servants. And depending on the disability or kind of neurodiversity the character has, they will notice different things about this room. The wheelchair user will notice a lack of ramp. The person with ADHD will notice everything. Their notice will jump from one shiny thing to another, and then they will either get overwhelmed and slink off into a corner, sta or stand in place, lost in thought, or run around the room admiring stuff as close up as possible. So one last thing about setting, take note as well of what is not being noticed by your characters and why. Okay, dialogue. You can decolonize dialogue too. Uh, oh, hold on a moment. The thing, the thing about dialogue is that it's one of the easiest things, easiest ways to differentiate your characters from one another. It's also one of the easiest ways to write a stereotypical character and to identify a writer with an unexamined bias. Be careful about changing the spelling of common words to approximate an accent. The accent that you are approximating may be stereotypical and you don't even know it. You may also accidentally imply that the character is uneducated when that isn't your intent. And JK Rowling is one of the greatest offenders in this regard. I have never been more insulted in my life. Half giant, moi, I have, I have big bones. That's, that's Madame Maxim in Harry Potter. I want to note that that is not how a French accent sounds like. And I would know because I have listened to my sister, an English teacher, teach Europeans English and her French learners do not sound like that at all. Hagrid, this is also an example. Well, you might have bent a few rules, Harry, but you're all right, really, aren't you? And, you know, honestly, visually, this is a pain to read. It also sounds kind of strange in your head. Slang and idioms. Slang and idioms that may be common to one culture or ethnicity, when used too often, may play up racial stereotypes and biases. So this was a... If you haven't seen the Snyder Cut, don't worry, I'm not spoiling it for you here. But um, off, I, uh, aside from the movie, stuff was going on in the background. Like Ray Fisher had disagreements with Joss Whedon and Jeff Berg about the inclusion of Cyborg Teen Titans Go catchphrase, Booyah. Fisher said he didn't want Cyborg relegated to being the catchphrase spitting cool black dude. That's, n that's not anything that I'm interested in watching. It's definitely not anything I'm interested in portraying. That's what he said. Own voices writers do not italicize words that aren't in English because these words are of their own language and their target demographic likely uses that language as well. It also demonstrates their faith in their reader's ability to derive meaning from context clues if they don't want to italicize a word. And the whole thing about italics is it highlights how that word is different from the rest of the words. And uh, I know a lot of writer friends who have had uphill battles with their editors and publishers regarding italics. Certainly, I, in my own work, I have stopped italicizing Filipino words, but I can't really go against, um, for example, house rules in a publication. Or at least not yet, anyway. 
sorry for going a little too fast because I have a lot to cover in the later sections. So we move on to character. And I want to note here that marginalization is not characterization. What do I mean by that? You notice how we tend to describe characters by their difference from the rest of the group? This is a normal tendency to differentiate what is considered culturally normal, but it does open us all up to bias. And in fiction, the cultural norm is straight, white, able-bodied, cis, head, male. Some examples. Left to right, if you couch the Avengers in D&D &D terms, we have... Tony Stark, who is arguably the mage, then the berserker, the paladin, the ranger, the tank, and the girl. If you weren't someone who thinks in those terms, you would call her the rogue or the spy, but she gets called as the girl because she is the only girl. Alternatively, you can also read it as left to right, the engineer, the monster, the soldier, the assassin, the god, the spy. You differentiate them by what they are not, not from the rest of the group. I got another example for you. The Mighty Morphin Rangers. Um, let's see. Uh, this one is slightly better than their girls now. So you can't call either of them the girl with for the team kimberly's description was a history of her romantic entanglements with guys while trini's gentle and kind nature was emphasized so how do you avoid these pitfalls how do you avoid characterization pitfalls you add more characters with the same marginalizations but of different personalities and beliefs and that way both you and the reader will avoid characterizing them by their marginalizations instead of Janet Burroway's speech, action, appearance, and thought. So here is a great example of characterization. Black Panther cast. Nearly the entire cast is black, which frees us up to describe the cast with markers other than their race. So left to right, the priest, the queen, the hero, the spy, or the love interest. The villain, the villain. This is slash genius. The best. But I hear you say, another kind? Not really. Because there are two white guys, you can't describe them as simply the white guys. Because they don't even share as. They do share a scene, but not many of them. And um, because there is more than one of them, you can describe them in relation to each other well-meaning CIA agent and the villainous arms dealer. Look, this happens a lot with marginalized creators. If you're, it happened to me too. If you're afraid your story has too many women or queers or differently abled people or neurodivergence or what have you, consider that the most popular fiction has an overwhelming cast of straight, white, cis, able-bodied males. If they can do it, why can't you? Okay, this is the really meaty part of my talk. You'll notice that I lumped plot, conflict, and narrative structure together. And that's because I really think that it's hard to teach the one without the other. They need to be in context, at least for this talk of mine. Hold on a moment. I have lost my notes. Okay. Here we go. So, first, William Forster believe that plot is a series of events rising out of character. The character makes impact on the world. The king died, and the queen died. That's the famous example that is trotted out when we discuss plot in these terms. Again, the character impacts the world. But in craft in the real world, we have this instead. Plot is the acceptance or rejection of consequences. The world impacts the character. And this is directly quoting from the book, 
The king died and the queen died of grief, but the people still have lives that continue in all directions, not independent of the other, but more meaningful for how they intersect. So yeah, the world impacts the character. But, you know, maybe you read fiction for a depiction of some semblance of control in an uncertain world. And that's fine. No one's judging you for that. But no, notice how often such stories only feature white protagonists. That's because such stories are written for a white audience only, even if the demographic reading the book is diverse. White is the default. In fact, here in the Philippines, so many people of my age and social class grew up with books, movies, TV shows, and games featuring white Americans because we were a former American colony. Many marginalized peoples tend to write fiction about the uncertain world affecting their protagonists because this world was not structured for us. So much of our lives are dictated by circumstance and coincidence. Many also write fiction featuring protagonists with their marginalizations affecting the world the way white protagonists do. But there is a, there's a nuanced difference. I'll get to that in a bit. Either way, both are valid. There is a place for both types of stories at the table. The problem arises when publishing gatekeepers, colleagues, and readers judge the former as being not of quality because it does not fit the mold that they are used to. And another symptom of the problem is publishers asking for more of the former without being open to more of the latter. This is often just wanting reskinned white protagonists on their part. And this is not okay as the reskinned protagonists still propagate colonial values like toxic individualism, competition, and conflict as a means to get ahead. Okay, so we're going to talk about conflict a bit. I'm sure a bunch of you are familiar with the type of conflict that are taught in class, man versus man, man versus God, man versus the world, man versus himself. I, either way, this is your protagonist, and this mountain here represents all of the obstacles. And your protagonist can, like, dynamite that mountain to get ahead. They can come at it with a baseball bat. In fantasy, they'll come at it with a sword or with a staff if they're a mage. In science fiction, probably shoot at it with a laser gun. Okay, cool, cool. Mix for entertainment. And this also that get over the mountain through it sometimes but mostly over but listen what if the obstacle is other people or precious resources what if these all live on the mountain what if all of these marginalizations and natural resources and culture and history are the mountain is a character whom we are meant to consider as heroic going to just fight their way through these people? Is that how de heroes deal with problems? Is are people only possessive of worth in relation to the hero? That's not the kind of fiction that I want to consume anymore. Now, this is what conflict looks like for the marginalized protagonist. It's wave upon wave of obstacles that keep crashing against them because they do not have the means to walk this world and deal with the obstacles head on. However, they might not realize it at the time, but the marginalized protagonist has the strength of a mountain. They are actively overcoming obstacles by deciding to stand their ground instead of charging in. This is also a valid way of presenting a character's agency in fiction. And unfortunately, when a lot of my marginalized colleagues do this, and then we go for a better read, we are told oftentimes, often by white Westerners, that your character doesn't have any agency. And as a developmental editor, disproportionately, I see it the most with non-white authors, this perceived problem but when i read the story the character definitely has done something they definitely have agency it's just not 
agency as defined by the Anglophone West. So let me tell you about active protagonists and inactive protagonists. As a developmental editor, I see this all the time in um, beginner, beginner's manuscripts. You're, you write about a character waking up and then going through their day, routine by routine. They get up, they walk to the bathroom, they wash their face, probably comb their hair, then they go downstairs and they eat breakfast. And honestly, that is what is meant by an inactive character. They're not really doing anything that affects the story. This, however, is what constitutes activeness in a character. It's fighting and winning, yes, but it's also showing restraint. It's advocating for yourself and your rights. It's listening and forgiving and ultimately surviving. So here's an example from Tade Thompson, a Yoruba story. A boy goes into a meeting of people older than he is and sits down. He greets his elders and then proceeds to shut the fuck up for an hour. When the meeting ends, he leaves. The elders then state what an impressive boy that was. And was he inactive? No. What is perceived as activeness in a character in publishing seems to be rooted in the American values of individualism, of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, of manifest destiny. It ignores the contribution and influence of community and society on the personality and actions of the individual. Also, conflict and competition are the tools of the colonizer. It's, these are the perfectly exemplified divide and conquer. And yes, both have existed in non-Western culture since time immemorial, but I'm talking about any colonizing culture that values conflict and competition and uses it to solve all of their problems. Am I saying that we shouldn't have conflict in our stories? Of course not. But know that a conflict approach to fiction, while common in the West, is far less common in other parts of the world. And more on that later when we get to narrative structures. A character may experience one or more conflicts, but they do not have to solve these conflicts with a competition mindset. What do I mean by that? Uh, wait, I'll explain that one later. But another thing is a character may experience one or more conflicts. Uh, well, they do not have to see these conflicts as games that they have to win. A story does not even have to be structured like a high stakes conflict in the first place. For example, in fan fiction, which I think is a legitimate way to write, fluff is all over the place and love fluff. I, I find it comforting in uncertain times like these, but for some reason, publishing does not want fluff. Maybe because they think fluff doesn't sell. So these are other concepts to use in your stories aside from conflict in terms of approaching problems. Community building, forgiveness, mercy, acceptance, reunion, reparations, self-actualization, curiosity, observation. And notice that these are values that do not serve the colonizer. They, a colonizer will probably try to ask forgiveness and mercy and acceptance from the colonized, but there's a lot to be done before any of those is given. Do I have any examples of stories that actually act this way? Yeah, I do. When Ged confronts his shadow, they, how do I put it, hug it out? He merged, he doesn't fight it. I mean, he spent a lot of the book running away from it and maybe fending it off. But in the end, he accepts it because it's really a part of him. A more recent example, is Moana and this movie made me cry in the theater because this part I read it as a metaphor for people in trauma people who are hurt and Taka is raging because somebody stole a part of her and she's been looking for it and she's been keeping people keeping everyone 
a way in the most destructive way possible. Moana is the first person since that heart was stolen to realize that Chika is not a monster at all, but somebody in pain. She sees her and she comforts her. And I think that's what anyone who is traumatized and who is in pain is looking for. And this is not something that you can achieve if you go at everything with a competition and conflict mindset. And shortly, we're going to move on to narrative structure. All right, so I'm sure I'll, many of you are familiar with this. This is a hero's journey uh, as uh, created and popularized by Joseph Campbell. Hero's journey is very useful when you're trying to write fiction for a Western audience. But outside of that tradition, it falls flat. Also, Joseph Campbell was a racist old man who purposefully ignored stories and cultures that did not fit into his narrow view of what stories should look like because he had an agenda to push. Any folklorist worth their salt does not use Campbell's framework in their own research. And you can Google this. I read a lot of it. Uh, they really do not like Campbell. So, but if we're not using the heroes... Oh, also, take note of the names, the different parts of the names of the call. We have, especially at the end, toward the left, we have an ultimate reward and master of two worlds. Like, how many of you have felt like they were the master of anything? When was the last time you felt that way? And also, like, does every journey need to have a reward at the end? Is it? like a given, there's a reward at the end of every journey. Are we all entitled to rewards? The journey itself could be rewarding, but like, I don't think anyone is entitled to give us rewards, nor are we entitled to take them. Okay, okay. so I'm sure you're all familiar with this one too. This is uh, what constitutes a plot, uh, what constitutes a story. You got an introduction, the inciting incident, Rising action climax, denima. However, this isn't the only way to structure a story. This is Kishoten Ketsu, and it is the, well, this is the Japanese version, but this is the East Asian way of structuring stories. It's very common in manga and anime, and K drama and C drama. So you start with an introduction, key. The development, moving upward, show. Then we have a twist, then, which you, like, it's at a left field. You don't know where this is coming from, but it will all connect in Ketsu, which is the conclusion. And Kishoten Ketsu is often um, held up as a great example when you're looking for structures that are not hero's journey in terms of story. And excuse me a moment, the dog has arrived. Aha. <laughs> Okay, but there are other narrative structures apart from Kishoto and Ketsu, and here are some examples. We have Daisy Chain, Robledo, Johaku, Epic, Hakawati, Bollywood, and there's so many more. I am going to give a link to the what do you call that? The blog post of a friend of mine, Kim Yunmi, who is also a science fiction and fantasy author. She has put together. She has put together an ongoing project that lists as many narrative structures across the world that she can find. And because she has been able to do this, she also came up with ingredients for making her own narrative structure. And what she has found is that the unique ones require like a philosophy of time, which is like, um, is it linear? Is it branching? Is it nonlinear? You need a central philosophy to drive forward the plot structure, a certain number of acts, and the rationale behind that certain number. A y-axis philosophy, which could be like emotionality, tenderness, anxiety, and a desired effect created by the overall story structure. So, in conclusion, don't immediately judge a story as bad, because it does not follow the structure you expect. These other story structures were created in response to their times, environments, 
and cultures, and they were effective. And, you know, I think there is something to learn from different narrative structures, something to learn not just about story, but about culture and about the way you yourself think. And last but not least, we move to theme. And even themes are not universal. Okay. Um, Matthew Salisi's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, I'm so sorry. He says in Craft in the Real World, a consideration of theme is always a consideration of audience. He also said, you can't control who reads your work, but you can control whom you write it for. Okay. To that end, let's discuss one theme, this um, good versus evil revolution sort of thing. Notice how many, how when many of us write stories about defeating the big bad, the story usually ends either after the revolution, just after, or the hero ascends the throne, thus reaffirming the status quo. Modern tastes dictate that we don't want our fiction to teach us lessons, but honestly, what do these choices in craft teach us especially younger readers who whether you like it or not are going to end up picking up your book especially if they're tired of books that are written for their age group ending at the point of revolution implies that we only need to break things and poof mess fixed ending at the point where the hero ascends the throne implies especially if they had zero training in statecraft that anyone can lead a country if they wave a big enough weapon at the problem and depending on the story, it may also imply that the same problems that kept the people poor, uneducated, and enslaved will still be kept in place. Someone else is just taking the reins. And for a real-world example, this is the Treaty of Paris. Spain colonized the Philippines for 333 years, and just as we were revolting against them, America bought us from Spain for $20 million dollars, and began to send missionaries to an already largely Catholic country. This Secretary, Secretary of State John Hayes is signing the treaty here, which seals the deal. I'm telling you, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. And here's a more recent example in media, and you might want to tune out for this if you haven't seen WandaVision yet, and you plan to. I'm super sorry, but this was appropriate to my talk. This show is about grief, yes, but it's also about justice. In WandaVision's last episode, they totally fucked up the entire series and Monica Rambeau's character with the line Monica says to Wanda. I had a discussion with Tade Thompson about this episode, and he had very strong feelings. He said on Twitter and in a separate conversation with me, Monica is the moral center, the conscience of the series. For her to have let Wanda go instead of trying to bring her to justice for her crimes, all grief aside, who doesn't feel grief? Is to give a white person a pass for doing horrific things to an entire community without their consent, all because she is a hero, quote unquote. Monica, according to Tade, also does not act like any black woman he knows, so what happened in WandaVision's finale is purely a white fantasy. So in conclusion, while marginalized people may not be your target audience, consider also that marginalized people will end up reading your work. So you need to treat readers respectfully via your treatment of themes. And some references. I completely forgot to note this book down, but uh, let me just read out the references while I find this book. So we have The Tough Guide to Fantasyland by Diana Wynne-Jones, Craft in the Real World by Matthew Salises, The Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom by Felicia Rose Chavez, Worldwide Story Structures by Kim Yoon-mi, and the one that I did not note, Dynamics of Folklore by Bar Tolkien. And thank you. That's the end of my presentation. I It was actually longer. I had a section on decolonizing workshopping, 
but I was getting worried about whether or not I would fit into this hour and uh, workshopping is tangentially related to writing anyway. Um, if you've got any questions, any more questions that um, I may not be able to address on Discord or if you want to talk more shop with me, I'm on Twitter at La Vie Moi, and you can email me at hello at vidacruz.org. But since I do have some, a shocking 10 minutes left, I will try to find some questions in the chat. <laughs> 